Welcome to worship on this third Sunday after Epiphany. I invite you to please rise as you're able for our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us from ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those who called us to welcome. Except our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us that we may be in the glory of your Son, born on us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ, and inheritors of eternal life. Live as free and forgiven children of God.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Blessed Lord God, you have caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. That comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of eternal life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the reading. A reading from Nehemiah, the 8th chapter. All the people of Israel gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of the Lord. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its master's handiwork. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not take dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of the great offense. (laughs) 
The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of one body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all, though many, for, for in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body was hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gift, the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and to proclaim relief to the captives. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to John. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Our reading today from 1 Corinthians is all about body parts. And it reminded me of a book I read a few years ago about youth and family ministry. And that story began, the book began with a story of a mad scientist. 
So once there was a mad scientist who decided to do an experiment involving a frog and how far it could go. He began his experiment by putting the frog at the end of a long table. Then he yelled, jump, stop, jump. Carefully, he measured the distance the frog jumped and wrote it down in his journal. He repeated this exercise twice more, each time recording the distance in his logbook. Then he surgically removed one of the frog's legs. Now remember, this is a man scientist, right? So again, he placed the frog at the end of the table and yelled, jump, frog, jump. And again, he carefully measured the distance the frog jumped and put it in his book. Again, he repeated the exercise and made notations. He followed the procedure two more times, removing another leg, commanding the frog to jump, and recording the distance in his log. But something changed when he removed the frog's fourth leg and yelled for the frog to jump. It remained stationary. It didn't move at all. The scientist yelled louder this time. Jump, frog, jump. Still, the frog did not jump. One more time he yelled even louder. Jump, frog, jump. But once again, the frog did not move. The scientist stepped over to his logbook and carefully made his last and final notation. The conclusion of his experiment, frogs without legs can't hear. <laughs> frogs without legs can't hear. How could the scientist have missed the obvious conclusion? The reason the frog did not jump when his last leg was removed was not because he had suddenly become hearing impaired. The frog didn't jump because without legs, the frog can't jump. To us, this story seems unlikely and a little absurd. No one could have missed that it was the missing legs that were the problem. The frog didn't need a hearing aid. He needed at least one leg to be able to jump. When the Apostle Paul was writing to the congregation in Corinth, he had to continually remind them of how they should be acting as a community. Was it because they were suddenly ignorant? I don't think so. More likely, it was because they were being faced with circumstances that were unexpected for them, out of the box type of stuff. They failed to see the forest for the trees, as they say. The Jewish members of Jesus' synagogue had been expecting a king, and so far Jesus did not fit that bill. He was not what they imagined for all these many years. When Jesus stood up in the temple and proclaimed that the spirit, the scripture from Isaiah was fulfilled in his time and place, they tried to throw him off the hill to silence him. They called him a heretic. It would take much time and many, many examples for even Jesus' constant companions to see who and what Jesus really was, to realize that he did not fit the old description, but in a new way, a way they had to learn through many examples over and over again, they would see his kingship. It may be hard for us to imagine their disbelief, but imagine if there was no New Testament, no Peter or Paul starting churches and spreading the good news. If all we had were the Hebrew scriptures and thousands of years of imagining the Messiah coming as a great and powerful king, we too might have found it hard to see Jesus as our long-awaited Messiah. And if we were somehow able to change our expectations, would we be willing and able to change everything, even our view of who God's people were, who and what was in our new community of faith? It was about this new view of community that Paul writes to the congregation in Corinth. They had been able to change their expectations about Jesus and Messiah, but when it came to their new church, some of the old views and expectations still had a strong hold. They were quarreling over the members, who they were, and who was most important among them. 
They still saw the Jewish people as God's chosen. And it wasn't easy to include or accept outsiders, Greeks, Gentiles, foreigners, any who were not part of their old original faith communities. So Paul uses the body as an example of parts working together for the good of the whole. Paul spoke of unity, not uniformity, of the beauty of things which are not exactly the same, but work together despite their differences. He used an example of what would be familiar to them. We all know that one part of the body is not working normally. The whole body is affected. If one of our legs hurts, the other must pick up the slack, bear the extra weight, which usually affects our backs. If we have a toothache, our head, neck, and jaw are usually affected, and so on. When we have pain in one area, the rest of the body seems to act in sympathy and slow down or not work at optimum levels. We need all of our parts to function efficiently. If one or two are out of sync, we may be able to get along, but there is a breaking point, a point at which the entire system starts to break down. So if we go back to the mad scientist and our frog, our frog was able to jump with one, two, or even three legs missing. But that fourth one made the job impossible. Its law simply could not be overcome. The story is from a book called Frogs Without Legs Can't Hear, nurturing disciples in home and congregation. And it may seem like a weird name for a book about Christian discipleship, but that's part of the point. If we want to be successful at bringing our children to the faith, if we truly want to make our homes and congregations into places that nurture and support Christians, we need to rethink the way we look at things. We need to think out of the box, stop using the same old methods that might have worked when we were kids, but don't work in today's fast-paced, high-tech world. We need to look at the church as more than what goes on inside this building. We need to think of Christian education as more than just coming to Sunday school confirmation class or Bible study and then forgetting about God for the rest of the week. Most importantly, we need to see the job of raising new disciples and supporting the ones that exist as more than just that of the pastor or Sunday school teacher. Oh, we play an important role to be sure, but families are the heart of our faith. And each and every one of us has a role to play in someone's faith development. Faith formation is not a one day a week endeavor for any of us. It is 24-7. We need to see God's face in all we see or hear at school, at work, in the mall, at home, on a bus, or on a train. We are all important parts of Christ's church. It's not the same as anyone is missing. Oh, we can hobble along for a while, but over time the loss takes its toll. Other parts begin to suffer. Collectively, we have so, so many gifts to share. The Holy Spirit has made sure of that. When we were baptized into Christ's church, that process began. It takes some of us a bit longer to find out what our gifts are than others, and they may change over time. What we were good at as a child may not be our gift as an adult. As we grow and change, we learn from every experience we have, every word we hear, every person that we meet. Know that you are all a vital part of this church community, each and every one of you. You are part of God's church that continues to stretch our expectations and make demands on us. Know that no matter how long, how young or old we are, what our political leanings are, or how frequently we even enter this space, we are first and foremost a gathering of the faithful here in this building and in our online community. We are a community that needs all of its parts to function and all of its disciples to use their daily lives as examples for others building up the body of Christ through its church communities, 
is work that is done by each member. Each part is providing value, cherished, equal. Each part working together. This is one of the major reasons we are in collaboration with our brothers and sisters at Gloria Day and King of Kings. Three Lutheran churches in Huntington using our hands and feet and very souls to do God's work. Discovering a unity needed to move forward rather than looking back on prior insecurities and falsehoods, leading by example in a broken world. Today, let us be reminded that no matter where our ancestors came from, whether they were Dutch or Swedish or German or native-born Americans, no matter how long we have been part of the ELCA, we are all Lutheran, all God's beloved children. That God gathers all of his people, saints and sinners alike, from each corner of the world and demands us to pay attention, to not miss the obvious, to see and hear and experience God everywhere, and to love all of our neighbors each and every day. The tagline of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America is God's work, our hands. Our is plural. All of our hands working together. The frog jumps farthest and easiest when all of the legs and arms work together in unison toward one goal. God's people work that way best too. So be ready, because when God yells, jump, people jump. God deserves our best efforts, our longest distance. And that is only possible when all of our hands and feet work together. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the Church, the world, and all that God has made. You reveal yourself to us in the reading of Scripture. Fulfill your word through the faithful witness of your Church. Send us out to bring your liberating good news to all people. God of grace. All creation proclaims your handiwork. Teach us to love the intricate and beautiful bodies that you have created. Bless tiny insects, enormous whales, and every creature in between. Sustain species at risk of extinction. God of grace. You desire that there be no dissension among us. Where we are divided in our society, nation, or world, come quickly to reunite us into one body. 
Peace, conflict, dispel violence, and bring an end to war. God of grace. Anoint with your spirit all who seek your favor. Grant provision and justice for people living in poverty, people living with disability, those living with pain or those living under oppression, especially Jerry, Nancy, Grace, Jean, Jim, Christina, Rob, Dave, Jackie, Steve, Teresa, Erin, Philip, Sebastian, George, Charlie, Betty, Karen, Phoebe, Jimmy, Janet, Lynn, Susan, Veronica, Charlotte, Kim, Meredith, Joanne, Willie, Jerry, Karen, Judy, and Judy, God of grace. Build up the body of Christ in this place. Bless the variety of ministries in this congregation. Empower us to freely welcome and deeply value each person who enters into worship and ministry among us. God of grace. In thanksgiving, we lift before you the saints for whom the promise of salvation has now been fulfilled. We pray especially for the family of John Stewart. Tend to those who mourn. Bring us together in your everlasting glory. God of grace. Since we have such a great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share God's Our stewardship thought for the week. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table. Nourish us with this heavenly food. And prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ our light. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Yet after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O God, and unite the wills of all who share in this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. 
gathered into one, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to God's table, there is a place for you in a natural hall. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all. Strengthen with the richness of your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Um, our announcements are on the green insert to your bulletin. Uh, welcome to all who have joined us today, especially any visitors. Um, please make sure you introduce yourself on your way out if I don't know you. Um, our intern was here last week, Sister Jean, and she will be starting next week. So please continue to keep her in your prayers as she begins this learning ministry with us. Uh, we still have some word in season and calendars out in the Northwest. Please feel free to take them. Uh, for your use. And we thank Jacobson Funeral Home for uh, providing us with these lovely calendars. Uh, we still have a position open for our sexton, which is a custodian. Uh, we realize maybe not everyone knows what that churchy word is, uh, but a sexton is someone that cares for the church facility. So if you know someone that is looking for some part time work Saturday and Sunday morning, uh, to uh, do some cleaning up and rearranging and, and some work here at church, please uh, let them contact Sandy um, or myself, and we'll give them more details on the job. Um, Rich Wagner is, has been doing this for many, many years, and he is extremely anxious to retire. So as soon as we find someone, that he will be able to do that. Uh, 
We continue to pray for all those um, in our prayers and uh, those who have uh, COVID or are experiencing uh, stress or anxiety or um, have been quarantined or isolated due to this continuing uh, pandemic that won't let go of us. So please keep all those uh, in your prayers and continue to stay safe as you venture about. Uh, that being said, we are having a, a small uh, coffee hour. Would you like to join us in our fellowship hall? Uh, please join us for that. The rest of our activities are here on our calendar. Uh, Bible study, uh, Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. And our um, choirs, except for the Jubilate, have taken a little bit of a break um, until some of the COVID numbers go down. Uh, but please speak with Lori Haddock if you are interested in joining any of those groups uh, when they continue. And so Richard Whitten, uh, if you wish to join our adults uh, for the Latte Choir. Uh, we also would like to um, celebrate a birthday today for Marianne Galler. Happy birthday. And you can blame your dear hubby for putting you on the spot. <laughs> We won't talk numbers to my house to talk about a lady today. Are there any other announcements? Bob, you're going to be in trouble later. <laughs> Please rise if you're able. God will leave you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you, and who calls you by name. Bless your going out and your coming in today and forevermore. What is our mission? Go with Christ into a weary world. Share the good news. And 